What makes a good day good or a bad day bad? The obvious answer to that question is what happens to you. The real answer to that question is that it all comes down to perspective. The Dalai Lama offers this. I find hope in the darkest days and focus in the brightest. I do not judge the universe. The world does not happen to you. It does not happen for you. It just happens. And the way you receive it determines so much of your reality. Will you overcome or will you be overcome? Do you grow from all the things around you or do all the things around you get in the way of your growth? So much of the world is out of your control. Yet the one thing that matters most is the one thing that is fully within your control. Your perspective. What happens when you broaden your outlook? What happens when normal does not just stay normal? The answer is fairly simple. Your eyes open wider and then there is no turning back. Once you see the other side, it's no longer the other side. When you cross borders, you begin to realize how unnecessary that border actually is. Once you understand someone different, the difference fades. Other than very few physical realities, limits are set in your mind. If you see restrictions, they emerge. Henry Ford has this quote, if you think you can do a thing or think you can't do a thing, you're right. We all have this gift, this ability to change our perspective, to open our perspective. How else does major change happen? Just imagine if Michelangelo had limited his perspective on art, but he didn't. He refused to see it the same way it had always been seen. What would have been if Eleanor Roosevelt had stayed within the boundaries of tradition? She didn't. As a result, a new way forward emerged. What if Jim Abbott had accepted the limitations of his perceived limitations? He did it! He did it! No hitter for Jim Abbott! What if we didn't have explorers? Or those who go first? Or those who invent? Or those who push for new awareness? Now what would happen if you decided to see a different world? A wider world? A kinder world? A more loving world? A more open world? What would happen if you crossed the borders that you've drawn in your mind? What could change with a change of perspective? Leadership only exists when a new vision appears. It's hard to see new when you're caught in what has always been. I do not judge the universe. Instead, let's be grateful for it. It may just shift your perspective. Amen? Amen. Yeah, if you haven't figured it out, we're talking about perspective today. And we're going to talk about what, what perspective is and all that kind of stuff. But it comes on the heels um, of, of our series, Hope. And if you missed last week, last week we talked about what hope truly is. We looked at uh, the Hebrew and the Greek word of it. And we recognized that hope was uh, literally talking about a rope. It, 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 hope means things that, are, uh, things that have come together, gathered together, intertwined together. And, and that's what hope truly is. And I, and I started thinking about that over the week, and I've had a lot of people come and contact me about uh, just that message last week about hope. And, and uh, it's funny that there's no hope when you're a single strand. If you're a single thread by yourself, there is no hope. Which is why the enemy does everything he can to, uh, to, to basically separate you, to seclude you. Why do you think most people that are depressed are usually by themselves? This is why it is important for the church to step up and be the community that the church has been called to be. To not be a single strand, but to be many strands uh, woven together. And that is what hope looks like. Hope is when there is somebody else standing right there with you. Let's just be real. Okay, we just did the Halloween thing, right? When you are scared, you never go into a room alone. Right? But you'll go into a room if you have two or three other people with you. And what do you guys do? You shove each other back and forth in front of each other. 
Come on, y'all went through haunted houses when you were little, right? Probably. And what did you do? You're always like, you, but you went as a group, right? Because if you go in as a group, the hope would be that you're going to make it through. At least maybe not all of you, but at least you will. Yes? Come on, anybody? That was a joke. Come on. <laughs> be with me today, right? So the reality is, is when we band together, stuff starts to happen. We move forward. And that's, that's the message of hope. And that's what God consistently brings to us all the time. Because see, back in, in the Old Testament, before there was Jesus, it was this idea of God being over there and us being over here. And we kind of felt like we were by ourselves. And when Jesus came and he died on the cross and he took everything, uh, every border, every, every sin, every, anything that disconnected us from him or separated us from him, he got rid of. Why? So that we could have hope in him. What does that mean? That means that we are with him. We're one. Does that make sense? And as the church, more of us come together and that's hope. Yeah? So make sure we're all on the same page. Okay. Now here's the next thing. The next thing when it, when it comes to hope, it comes to basically your perspective. Because if we're going to be honest, um, when we're connected with a bunch of people, right, there's different perspectives. And this is the one thing that I think the Lord just kept uh, sharing with me over and over and over again um, uh, as I was uh, preparing this message was this concept. The concept said, uh, oh, let's go to the concept first and we'll get there. My bad. That was my fault, y'all. My bad. Thanks. Thanks, Ethan. All right. Your position determines your perspective. Your perspective then determines your actions and your motives. Yes? Let me walk it through with you guys. Okay? Your position determines your perspective. Okay? Let's say you go to your favorite sports championship thing, whatever it is. I will use, um, I'll use the World Series. Okay, because that just took place. So the World Series. You get tickets to the World Series. You spent a bunch of money and you are so excited. You show up to the World Series and you take your seat and it's right in front of a pole. Right? That immediate moment, your position, where you are at, is now going, uh, is now going to determine the perspective, what you can and cannot see. Do you guys follow me on this one? So I sit down and I'm like, I paid a bunch of money for this, right? But the guy right next to me, who is literally just right next to me, is like, these are awesome. I can see everything. Do you see where his position is, is his perspective. Same people, same game, same time, sitting right there, only an inch apart from each other, but their position determines what they can see or can't see. Everybody with me on this one? Yes? Then, from that, your perspective determines your actions and your motives. The guy that is sitting in front of the pole, do you think he's going to be happy? Do you think he's excited that he's at the World Series? No, because I can watch it better on TV. Right? Now, everything from there, every action from there on uh, forward is, is, is motivated or determined by that position that he was in. Are you walking in this? So you guys can get this, right? So we have a perception. So I want to show you guys a, a couple perceptions, okay? Okay, so the first perception is this picture here. It's about people talking, right? You see people talking? Yeah. Or is it chess pieces? Both. It's, it is both. <laughs> but what do you see will determine your perspective. All right, or your, your position determines your perspective. So some of you are sitting here and you're like, oh, those are people talking. And other people are like, no, those are chess pieces. And now let's get in an argument over because that's what we do in 2020. We argue over everything. No, they're chess pieces. No, they're people arguing. Let's go a little deeper, okay? Let's go to the next one, okay? Next one. Do you see a rabbit or a duck? It's both. <laughs> it's a rabbit or a duck, but your perspective right? Your perspective now, where you're positioned at, you're going to see it. Some of you guys are sitting here right now, and you're like, Craig, I don't see one. Obviously, can you guys see the duck? Yes. Now look at the rabbit. There's the ears. There's the, there's the eye and the nose and the mouth right here, and he's looking that way. Do you see the rabbit now? Yes. Down here, this is my favorite one. You see the two old people looking at each other? Or is it a guy playing a guitar singing to his lovely lady? 
Does that make, yeah? And this one is by far my favorite. Some of you are sitting here right now and you're like, that is an old, ugly woman. And some of you are sitting there going, no, that is a young maiden staring off into the distance. And if you can't see it, let me walk you through it. Some of you guys might online might be able to see it. Okay? So if you look at it, the young maiden looking off into the distance, here is the, the, her face. This is her nose right here. This is her chin. Comes up under here. This is her neck. There's a choker on her neck, and it comes down to her shoulder. Everybody see that? That is a young lady staring off into the distance. This is a little bonnet. It's super cute, right? This is her ear, if you guys are looking at it that way. If you don't want to see the old lady, this is her mouth. This is her nose with a little hump, and it goes to her forehead. This becomes her eye, and this becomes, do you guys see it? Can you see both? Okay. Perspective becomes everything. Because we can sit down all day long and be like, look at that cute little rabbit. What duck are you talking about? Does that make sense? And now all of a sudden, because somebody doesn't have the same perspective as you, because they might not be in the same position as you are in, now all of a sudden our actions get a little crazy. Is this, is this making sense? So here's what I'm going to ask all of us to do uh, in, in, in our lives as we, are, as we are walking with Christ, is this. Let's do our best not to judge everything off of the position that I'm in. But let's judge everything off of the position that God is in. Did that make sense? Let me explain how this works. When I come into a situation, I put me into the situation. It's my position, which means it's my perspective. And all my actions are going to come from my perspective. So when somebody comes up to you and they are having a horrible day and they are yelling and they are making fun of you or they're yelling at somebody else and we judge them immediately. We say, man, they are having a, they're, they're just mean or evil or they're just, what's wrong with them, blah, blah. Instead, we shouldn't judge them off of that. We should look back at ourselves and say, I wonder what position or perspective they have that made that moment happen. Did that make sense? Instead of just ripping everybody apart, this is how we can live a life in love instead of living a life in judgment. Yes? Everybody so walk with me. So we're going to show you guys this uh, uh, in Daniel chapter 5. I want us to kind of get a, a grip of this in Daniel chapter 5 and watch the amazing, how amazing our God is. He's just, he's amazing. So here's what I wanted to show you. And, and uh, here's the, back, the backdrop to this, okay? In Daniel chapter 5, um, we have a man named Daniel. Now, Daniel is going to be um, somebody special, a head. Uh, he's basically really high up um, in the government of, of basically Babylon. And you're gonna, he's not only in Babylon, it's going to be Persia. It's going to be all these different places. Me, anyways. Um, but the reality is, is he's really high up there. And the first time that we ever see him is with a, a king called Nebuchadnezzar. And you guys have probably heard Nebuchadnezzar because you guys kind of know about uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Um, this is the guy that, that created a statue. And if you didn't bow down to that statue, every time that you heard music, he would throw you into a fire, right? Well, Daniel is part of, the, uh, is part of that crew. And, and Daniel's kind of right there because he gets to interpret a lot of the dreams and stuff that, that goes on with Nebuchadnezzar. Well, if you guys don't know, Nebuchadnezzar goes insane. Actually, God allows him to go insane. Now, when I say insane, I literally mean by our standards, he would be insane. He literally thought that he was an animal. He started eating grass. And for se I think it was for seven years, um, he lived like an animal. And this was the richest, most highest person on uh, the planet at the point in time. Like, this is like, it would be like you, you I don't know, like name anybody. Then they just kind of go crazy and they just start go wandering out into the forest and start eating grass. Right? You kind of look at that and be like, uh-oh, something happened there. And the reason that this took place was basically because uh, uh, of God. You didn't respect God. You, loved, you, you said that you loved God. You, you, you made all these decrees about God, about him, but God said you still didn't respect or honor me. And what happened? He went insane. Okay? And now uh, it picks up. That's, chap uh, that's basically chapter four. Chapter five. Uh, 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 chapter five uh, picks up um, with his son. His son is now in charge, and his son um, does his. Uh, his son likes to throw lavish parties. 
Which is funny because, I, I'm sorry, I laugh at that because I, I think of like all the people nowadays and like when you look at the social media stuff and you look at all these like rich people and their kids, what do their kids always get caught with? Partying, right? They're like drunk driving, they have these lavish parties with all these, all these drugs and, and, and women and this and stuff. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we have not changed ever. We see this in, in Daniel chapter 5. We have the exact same scenario. Nebuchadnezzar's son, right? Um, his name is Belshazzar. And, and Belshazzar um, is, is basically sitting there and he's throwing these lavish parties. And he's getting absolutely hammered. He is getting uh, drunk off of all this wine and all this stuff. And one of the parties that he's having, he's it, like, like things, I mean, this is like, this is huge. Thousands of people. You guys got me? Thousands of people. They're, they're partying. And all of a sudden, a hand appears. A glowing, if you will, hand appears, and it starts writing on the wall. Now, now, you got to walk with me on this one. That's scary. If you're out partying and you're having a good time, and all of a sudden, in, in your chamber, uh, a hand comes out of nowhere, and it starts to write on the wall. Now, here's the thing. In my head, I just I, I want to imagine that it's glowing. Okay? I don't know why. I just want to imagine that it's glowing. Just more for a dramatic effect. You know what I mean? I have no idea if it was glowing or not. But how awesome would that be if he starts writing on the wall and the things are glowing? And it does. It starts writing on the wall. This hand starts tagging in the, in the, in the chambers of the king. Everybody got it? Everybody's flipping out. They are all they're like, whoa. It literally says that the king changed colors. Literally, that's how scared he was. He changed colors. So he's yelling. He says, get the mystics. Get all the, the sorcerers. Get everybody in here. And you tell me, what does that say? You tell me what that says. And, then, and, and, and it says, it doesn't say once, it says twice. It says, and he still lost his color. The mystics, the sorcerers, they all come in and they look at it and they have no clue what language it is. They have no idea what, what's going on. They're like, we don't know. And he says, somebody has to know. Right? And so he says, somebody has to know these things. And sure enough, they go, well, there's this one guy. I mean, he was with your father. But I don't know. Well, let's see if we can find him. His name is Daniel. So Daniel, they find him, and he shows up. And I just, I imagine Daniel being like a detective at this moment when he shows up. Kind of walks in. He's going to be a little bit older at this point in time. Kind of walks in, and I, there's just wine bottles everywhere. Like, things are falling, ripped down. And the king goes, mm, what does that say? I hand came out of nowhere and wrote that on the wall. What does it say? And he looks at it, and he looks back at Belshazzar, and I love what he says. I got it. We're going to read this. This is Daniel uh, chapter 5. Uh, it says this. It says this. Your majesty, the most high God gave your father, Nebuchadnezzar, sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all the nations and all the people of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant, and hardened with pride, he was disposed. Uh, he was disposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like the ox. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and set over them. At over them anyone he wishes. I want to read that one more time. Okay? Does this whole, the backstory of Nebuchadnezzar start to make sense now? So, all this king wants to know is what's written on the wall. And this dude, Daniel, decides to get up there and share history. And I want to say this. He was 
insane until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and sets over them anyone he wishes. Anyone he wishes. Listen. We all get to vote, right? Y'all get to do that. God already knew the outcome way longer than you did. None of the thing shocks him. We can't sit back and look at COVID and be like, oh, you know, like what did we say when COVID hit? Nothing shocked. God knew that this was coming, right? Don't we all know that God knows what's going on? Why do we act like we don't? Because our perspective in the position and where we sit. Does that make sense? Let me give you something on this one. A position doesn't necessarily mean a physical thing. It could also be a state of mind. Okay? Like pride can be a state of mind. Right? Remember how we read that he was prideful? And what happened? When he was prideful, God changed his position so that way he could see what was really taking place. Some of us, we sit in our pride and we make decisions and actions and we have our motives based on a sin, pride, more than based on what God is trying to do. Yes? If you guys didn't know, we love to walk around as Christ followers and what do we always say? Hope, hope, hope God. Love God. Love, hope, hope, hope. But then when it comes to actually trusting in God, what do we do? Ah, I wonder what he's doing. Does, are you guys, you, you're with me on this one, right? We freak out like he doesn't know that like he's not in charge. God is always in charge. And right now, Daniel, who was taken from his people, not allowed to worship his God. Are you, are you with me on this one? Taken from his land, taken from his people. He was outcasted. He was put into a land he did not know. Told that he cannot worship his God. Told that he had to worship other gods. He was told all these things. And what did he do? In his heart, his position was completely shifted. And what did he do? God's still sovereign. Do what you got to do. Are you guys are with me on this one? His position determined the perspective in which Daniel was going to have. And because of that, he followed God no matter what. Yes? If you haven't figured it out yet, I'm poking you and I'm asking you, where's your position? What's your perspective right now? Where are you at? Because if it's not a heavenly mindset, we need to get there. We need to trust in God because he's the one that does this. And I find it really funny that this was already plastered on there before, before I knew any of this stuff was going to come to pass. We set these sermons up way in advance. And I laugh because I'm sitting there and I read that and I was like, oh God, you're perfect. God, you're perfect. It's just amazing to see how he puts things together. Anyways. He puts anyone he wishes. Verse 22, back, to, this, the, back to, to, the, to the writing on the wall, back to all this. He says, but you, Belshazzar, his son, you have not humbled yourself, though you knew all of this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets of, of this temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines, drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, uh, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds his hand, uh, who holds in his hand your life. Life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. Before I get to the inscription, did you guys catch what he just uh, rebuked Balthazar, the king, with? You knew God. You understood God. You saw what happened to your father when you go against God, and yet you still dishonored him. You still chose to go a different direction, knowing who our God is. So Balthazar, the writing is literally on the wall for you. If you guys are wondering where that, uh, that, uh, that phrase came from, it literally comes from this Bible, the, this Bible uh, account. If you guys ever heard that? I know the young ones in the back, they're like, what? There's a thing that says, oh, the writing's on the wall, isn't it? This is literally where we get that from. The writing is on the wall. This is the inscription that was written. 
Main, 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 tahal, parhasin. Here is what these words mean. Main, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tikal, um, you have been weighed on the scales and have been found wanting. Uh, Paras, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and uh, Persians and Persians. Then at that, Belthazar's command, uh, then at Belthazar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Woo! Does anybody else see how this is super weird? Anybody else? I just want to throw this out here. This guy is super scared. Belthazar is super scared. He doesn't know what to do. All the people that he trusts in don't know what's going on. He calls in this random guy named Daniel who comes in and basically makes fun of him. Bro, you knew this. You saw your father. Reprimands him. Rebukes the king. And then after he's done rebuking the king, tells him, your days are numbered. You're no longer going to be king. God has weighed you. He's found you wanting. You don't deserve a throne, right? And then your kingdom is going to be divided. We're going to give it to the Medes and the Persians who you don't like. So what do you do with that? Give him a robe. Give him some fine clothes. Put a gold chain around his neck. Thank you, Daniel. Did, did, no, anybody else? Like, like, right? I'm sitting there, I'm like... You just literally rebuked somebody. You told them the worst news that they could probably hear in their entire lives, especially as a king. And all of a sudden, you're going to jump up and be like, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you this stuff. I told people I was going to give you stuff, so you told me what was going to go on. Here you go. I give it to you. Everybody with me? Uh, there, did, I go, did I go further than that? Okay, there, that very night, <coughs> that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom and at the age of, and at the age of 62. This was real quick. Daniel walks in, the, the writing on the wall freaks out, Daniel comes in, Daniel reads it to him and says this is what it is and he he says okay that's what it is and that night he dies. Everybody get it? Crazy story, right? Crazy thing. It, it keeps going further for Daniel. Because remember, Daniel now is now the third highest in the state, all right, or in the government. Now, when uh, Darius comes and he takes over from that, he keeps Daniel in a position. Matter of fact, depending on uh, how your Bible is written, uh, it's actually going to call Daniel a president. He's going to literally call him a president, which is basically like this governor type of thing. There's a staff, um, which is, there's just these, these positions. Now, here's what you need to know what happens next in this. Because remember, we're talking about positions and perspective, right? Right? So our position puts us into a different perspective. Okay? Now, Daniel, in his perspective or his position, has to see things a little differently. Daniel will always still follow God no matter what. All the other governors and all the other people uh, uh, in, in power and authority looked at this and they went to Darius the king and he said, listen, nobody should be worshiping anybody else but you and the gods that we worship. Do you agree? And he's like, Darius, of course I agree. He goes, make a decree that you cannot worship for the next 30 days anything or anybody, you know, any other god but you. Because obviously he thought it was a god. Yes? And the reason that they did this is because there is nothing that they could do uh, against Daniel. See, Daniel was so righteous and upright, it said that there was nothing that they could do to try to get him out of power. Because let's just be real, Daniel's the oddball. He's the one in power where he's walking around and he's doing things, why? Or, or it's not why, but with godly things, right? He's walking around saying, well, we're gonna do this instead of that, why? Because it helps out the people because this is what God wants. Well, the kingdom wants this. I don't care. We're going to do this. I'm in charge. This is the way it's going to be. We're going to do kingdom stuff. Yes? They couldn't figure it out. They're like, no, we can't do with this. You're too busy doing your God thing, and we want to do our, our, our country thing. We want to do our God thing. We want to do this. Yes? You see? Position? Perspective. Yeah? 
and then the action. So they tried to figure out a way. Their position said, we're in a position of authority. We're going to try and get Daniel out because we don't like what he's doing. So therefore, they made a decree, and the decree said, you're not allowed to do that. You know what Daniel did as soon as he heard about the decree? As soon as he heard about the decree, he walks home, goes to his room, opens his window, kneels down, and three times a day he prayed to God. These men knew about this, so they followed him. They followed him, and they got him red-handing. Red-handing? How about red-handed? Let's go with that word instead. Um, caught him red-handed praying to God. So they grab him. They throw him in front of the king. This is Daniel. And, and the king knows Daniel very well. Matter of fact, because of what Daniel's been doing, Daniel has helped the kingdom out in a mighty way. Are you, are you walking in this? The king is like, what did he do? Well, he was praising a different God. And he's like, well, yeah, you made a decree. You said that if anybody praises a different God in the next 30 days, they get thrown into the lion's den. It tells us in the scriptures in chapter 6 that the king, Darius, spent all night trying to figure out a way to get Daniel out of this, out of this position. I, I love it. I want you to get this. Try to get Daniel out of the position. The king, who's supposed to rule everything, can't go against his own decrees. Does it make sense? He has to throw Daniel into the lion's head, but he tries everything that he can. He stresses himself out, and he literally looks at Daniel, and he says, Daniel, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but I have to do this. And Daniel's like, it's cool. I'm good with it. Why? Because if you feed me to the lions, I know where I go. To be absent here is to be present with my God. And I'm good to go. So if that's the position that I'm in, then his perspective wasn't fear. His perspective wasn't, wasn't um, uh, anger. His perspective was, let it happen. It is what it is. And he says, and, and the last thing that the king says to him, may your God protect you like he has in the past. May your God take a stand for you right now. And he throws him into the lion's den. And he covers up the hole. And the king sits there all night long, worried and fretting. And I love this because why? The position that the king is in, this is changing his perspective, don't you think? I made a decree. I made something that puts somebody else, somebody that I care about in harm's way. Therefore, I, I want to get him out of this and I can't get him out of this. And he freaks out all night long doesn't even sleep, it says. It says he, he doesn't even sleep. He waits for the break of dawn. And as soon as the break of dawn happens, he rolls the stone away and he yells, Daniel, are you there? And Daniel's like, we good? I don't know. That's Craig Paraphrase's version of the Bible. Just want to make sure you're all still with me, okay? He basically yells out, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And they pull him out. Now, here's the thing. I don't know about you, but my brain, I have an over and active imagination. I imagine that Daniel all night long uh, was playing um, with the lions like you would with a cat. Like, you know what I mean? Like, he's like, oh, you're just a funny lion. And the lion lays down. He's like clawing at him like, ah. And then I imagine like they got tired after playing after a while. And he lays on one of them like a pillow. And another one like comes up and snuggles up next to him. You know, and if you have cats, you know what I'm talking about, especially indoor cats, where at night they want to curl up into, on your feet. And imagine like a lion just lays on his feet all night long. He's like, I can't even move. Like, I'm good. And he just sits there. Like, like I, this is just my imagination, okay? I have no idea if that happened. I just think it's cool, right? Because I want to see how cool my God is. I'm like, I'm sure he wasn't like cowered in a corner like, oh no, oh no. I, I just had this thing like God's just like, they're just big kitties. Don't worry. Use your authority. Use the position that I gave you. And he gets in there and he's like, listen, cats, we're going to play. <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's just, come on, come on. And they're all good, right? Um, so he pulls him out. He pulls him out. And uh, the king so angry by what the people that he trusted did. And he says, I, you, I'm going to take you, I'm taking your wives, and I'm taking your kids, and I am throwing you into the den. That's a little messed up, right? 
but he has the position, he has the, he has the authority to do that. And sure enough, he takes those, uh, those people in authority and those governors and he throws them into the den. And it says before they even hit the ground, it says that the lions broke every bone in their body before they even hit the ground. And of course, because they were hungry, they didn't have food the night before. So, um, <laughs> so listen, all the playing that they were doing, they got hungry, all right? So do you guys get what I'm saying here? He had this position, and he was so angry, and he threw him in. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just telling you guys how, how this account unfolds. And this is what he says in chapter 6. This is uh, what uh, Darius says. He says, uh, Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and all peoples of every language in all the earth, you, uh, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must... Fear and, uh, and fear and reverence uh, the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion uh, will never end. He rescues and he saves. Uh, he performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius, uh, uh, Darius or Darius, and the reign of Cyrus uh, the Persian. Everybody good? That's it, right? Yeah. Here's where I want to go with this, uh, on this. As you guys are reading that, what happened? There was despair. What was Daniel told? You can't worship your God. And if you do, you're going to die. Despair. The opposite of hope is despair. You can't have hope without despair. Does that make sense? So therefore, if you are sitting back in, in, in the position that you are in, if the position that you are placed in right now is a position of despair, that is the best position you can be in. Why? Because you know hope is coming. The question is, where's your perspective as you sit there? Are you sitting there fretting, worried, and oh, all life is ending? This is the worst thing ever. Are you sitting back like Daniel was and just saying, I still get to be me. I still get to praise the Lord the way that I'm going to praise the Lord the way that he asked me to. He didn't just sit in despair. He knew it was despairing times. He knew that he knew his time was coming, but he, made, he, he basically came to terms or grips with it. And he said, I'm good. If this is how it's going to be, then I, I end in a lion's den. Are you, yes? For you, we have to understand, with one thing comes another. So our perspective in life has to be able to change to what God is doing. So if there's ever anything that's going on in your life where you're like, why is this happening to me? Don't be like Nebuchadnezzar. Don't be like Belshazzar and try to do it yourself and be selfish and try to figure things out on your own. That only leads to death or eating grass. I'm not sure which one, but it leads to one of those, right? We've got to get to a place where we recognize I am no gonna, longer going to look at these things the way that a human does. I'm going to look at it as my Father in Heaven does. And when I start to look at things, despair turns to hope real quick. But despair can't turn to hope if you're by yourself. Notice in this story that like Craig Daniel was by himself. No, he wasn't. Who was pulling for him? The king that threw him in the den himself. He had a king sitting there going, I'm going to try everything I can to get out of this. I'm going to do everything that I can. And on top of that, how many other people do we know about that aren't written there, that are praying for him? I don't think Daniel was a loner, right? He's got to have people that were sitting there, and he's like, this is what's going to happen. And they were praying for him. I bet you they were praying all night for him. Who do you have? Craig, I don't have anybody. Then get to a church. And don't sit there and try and hide. Walk up to people. Try to meet them. Try to talk to them. Get connected. Will it take time? Absolutely. I find it really funny that people sometimes come to church and they try it one time. They're like, oh, they were unfriendly. One time unfriendly? How do you know? That's somebody that's living in judgment, not sitting there trying to build community. Does that make sense? Listen, we are in a day and age and a time where, God, or where, where, where the enemy is coming against God in one way. He's trying, to, he's trying to pull us apart. He's trying to divide and conquer. I don't know if you guys have seen this or not. It is up to us as the church to be hope to the world. 
How do you do it? We stay united. We stay united in all that we do. Why? Because it's not about uh, whatever's going on worldly. It's about kingdom mindset. And if we can come with a kingdom mindset, can we move forward together in unity? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what I, my biggest thing today is this. My last, the, my, my last, it's the first thought process. I want to remind you, your position determines your perspective. Your perspective then determines your actions and your motives. So where are you at today? That's the question. What position do you feel like you're in today? What perspective should you have? If you feel like you're going to the den, and you feel like it's all over, and you feel like the writing's on the wall, this is the time that God can show up the most. Get around some people. Love on people. Have people love on you and watch what God will do with you. Amen? Amen. Yeah? Yeah. All right. So, Father God. Uh, wait, bands, come on stage. If you're at a venue, uh, bands, you can come on stage as well uh, at all the venues. And we go from there. So, Father God, we just come before you. And God, today, as we enter into worship, we want to praise you. We want to praise you and worship you because of who you are, because of the position that you hold. You are, you are the Lord of lords. You are the King of kings. And nothing takes that away, Father God. And so, God, no matter where we're at right now in our lives, whether we are prospering, Father God, or whether we are in despair, we will still stay connected with you. We will still have hope, Father God. We will not be uh, 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 like Belshazzar, and we will not forget who you are and what you have done. I love what King Darius says. You know, I just feel like as we enter into worship, um, I want to read his decree one more time. So we can, uh, eat the, if you pull that up on the screen, I just want to read his decree as a, basically as a prayer. May you prosper greatly. This is the decree that in, that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. So as we move into worship, have reverence, respect, and honor for our King. For He, God, is the living God, and He endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and He saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Father God, we stand on the King's decree. You are these things. And as you saved uh, uh, Daniel, I pray that you would come into our lives and the places that we need saving, you would save. If you need to break addictions this morning, break addictions this morning, Father God. God, if you need to um, mend um, some emotional trauma that has taken place in some people's lives, I pray that you would start to mend. You're, you're a great God. You can do all things. So Father, right now, whatever needs to be done in our lives, let it be done. And put us in the positions that we need to be put in so that we can have your perspective and look through your eyes, your lens, and see how great this place really is. So Holy Spirit, we worship you today in Jesus' name. Desperate for you I'm 
desperate for you I surrender With arms stretched wide, I know you hear my cry, speak to me now, speak to me now. With arms stretched wide, I know you hear my cry, speak to me.
Faithful 
Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. Your promise still. Uh, I just want to focus on this, the hope that is in uh, this statement. Um, I'm still in your hands. Right? I, can we put it on the screen? I'm still in your hands. And this is my confidence that you haven't failed me yet. This is the trust that we need to have in our God. The world can shake. The people can scream. There could be all these things. But I need to stand on this. I am still in your hands. That's where my confidence is. You haven't failed me yet. The only thing that determines this is your, posi your position and your perspective. You are never without hope as long as God is with you. Amen? So Father God, we stand on the truth today. We stand on what you're doing.
God, help us in, our, in, in, our, in, in, in the perspective that we have. God, if we don't like our position, then we change our perspective until our position can change. So Holy Spirit, be with your people today. And right now, um, I just feel this overwhelming sense like if there's somebody, whether you're at home or online right now um, in a venue, if you feel like you need a healing, or there's something going on in your life that you need to, God, I feel like the Lord is just saying right now, ask me. Have confidence and right now, ask me. Ask me what you need. Talk to me. Tell me what you need right now. And as you share the things that you need right now, may he change your perspective and your position. And may you have the hope that you are going to be okay. So Holy Spirit, as you hear your sons and daughters cry out to you, I just want to say thank you that we even have the opportunity to cry out to you. That we even have a right to talk to you. So I want to say thank you for the cross. Thank you for making a way for us. And God, we end it with this. We're still in your hands. You are our confidence. Thank you for never failing us. We love you and we praise you. And all that agreed said, amen. amen.